Welcome, everybody. My name is Mikey Mhenna. I'm calling from Beirut. I'm the executive director of Afikra. Thank you so much for, for joining today. I am very honored to introduce our special guest, May Masri, who is a Palestinian filmmaker who was born in Jordan, raised in Beirut, and studied film at UC Berkeley and San Francisco State University. She has directed and produced award-winning award films that have been broadcast on more than 100 television stations worldwide, including PBS, BBC, Channel 4, France 2, and many more. In 1995, she founded Nude Productions with her late husband filmmaker, Jean Charon. Her films have received over 90 international awards, including the Lucino Visconti Award in Italy in 2003, the Asia Pacific Screen Award in Australia in 2007, and the MIPDOC Trailblazer Award in Cannes in 2011. May Masri, thank you so much for joining our first conversations. Thank you, Mikey. This is a great introduction. I'm and so happy that you're, you're here. Doing. Thank you, same here. Um, you know, I like starting most of these conversations a little um, biographically. So as I mentioned in the introduction, you were born in Jordan, raised in Beirut. Um, so I'm curious, what were the films that really struck you as a, as a child? Do you, remember, do you remember watching TV and films as a kid in, in Beirut? Um, what memories do you have of that? Well, we didn't really have much TV <laughs> when I was or, growing or up. Or I guess cinema. Maybe there was I only say one channel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But maybe the uh, cinema. Uh, there was a cine club uh, and then at university. Uh, they, I mean, one of the major films that really marked me were, uh, was uh, Yusuf Shaheen's uh, films, Al Ard and Al Asfur. Those, I mean, I've seen, of course, a lot of the regular commercial films, but I remember that those two films were really marked me. Um, but uh, cinema wasn't really something, you know, when I, growing up, I, it wasn't um, a major, I we used to go to the cinema maybe once, uh, every once, or once a week or two weeks, but it wasn't something, it was later that I discovered film and it was a gradual process. Yeah, was it, um, so you went to, you went to California did you go to study film or did you find yourself, I read somewhere online that um, you, you took this film theory class and it kind of inspired you. Um, exactly. What did you, what did you encounter in that class? Well, I mean, it was by, uh, was by chance really, but I think I was prepared for that without knowing because growing up, I was very visual. And I loved, uh, I loved, uh, you know, I, I think I, I was used to think more in images than in words and uh, storytelling. And, uh, and then there were growing up too, there was a lot of like the, the student movement and the political kind of uh, cultural atmosphere of Beirut. I think all that prepared me. And then the war broke out in 1975 in Lebanon. So the schools were closed most of the times. And I left Beirut in uh, 76 to go visit my brother in Berkeley. So it wasn't really, I didn't know what I wanted to study. I was 17 years old. And I just uh, happened to walk into a film class in Berkeley and it was amazing for me. It was like love at first sight, you know? Did you have a camera? I didn't, I had a, 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 a still camera, but not- Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. but you know, like as a kid, were you, were you one of those kids who was interested in like fascinated by the idea of a camera and lens and capturing stuff and were you one of those kids uh, not really no no but it was more the the storytelling and the artistic uh, kind of uh, and wanting to say something you know i grew yeah. up at a time when there were a lot of movements uh, a lot of uh, you know, Beirut was such a vibrant city. So it was more about what to do with my life. I wanted to find something that would make an impact. So finding film, everything seemed to fall in place. And uh, that summer, I remember I was like watching tons, hundreds of films, reading film books. It was like, uh, you know, um, I was lucky really, I think at 17 to find something so passionate, and um, and that's when I became interested in the camera, and yeah. um, if the moving image, all that. You know, it really came together in '76. So um, before we get into some of your films, just to stick on this idea, I'm curious about some of the early films that um, while you were in California and studying, 
that really left an imprint that you kind of see, maybe nobody else can see it, but you see the, the traces of the DNA of those films in, in your work. Yes, I mean, I watched the, I mean, the films that really touched me, I think, were the films, um, the Italian uh, neorealism films, Fellini, uh, Daviani Brothers, that poet poetic kind of lyrical cinema, yeah. uh, the neorealism too of Rossellini, and then Latin American cinema. Yeah. Because um, it was a time of revolution, you know, the 70s. And San Francisco, I discovered, you know, was like a hub as well after Beirut, you know, of all that um, yeah. third world cinema and um, the surrealist movement too in uh, Spanish films, Buñuel, that beautiful surreal films, uh, um, the Cinema Nova, Brazil, Cuba, the Chile, you know, all those films were like amazing for me to watch. And I think they influenced uh, my work later because this is the cinema I like, you know, magical realism, uh, working with people, uh, uh, having something, a strong human message to say. Yeah, it's like, a, it's like that Shaheen uh, Bebe Al Hadid um, film as exactly. well. Exactly. Yeah. I love his early work. Bab al Hadid, Al Ard, Al those films really had an impact on me. Yeah, it's interesting because um, you, you know, aside from your last film, you deal in realism, not, not surrealism, right? Um, but there are, there, are, there are traces of that. That makes sense to me, you know, this idea of social messaging and um, really trying to understand the human condition and, and, and capture that. Yeah, but also with a lot of humanity, you know, and a lot of poetry. I think you can find that, uh, that's that is like a challenge for me as a filmmaker, how to find the poetic in the everyday life, you know, uh, and bring that out. Uh, and that's, I really love that kind of, uh, you know, it's, you never really in films, you don't really document uh, exactly what you see. It's more of an interpretation of the, and bringing out that beauty to, despite all the, you know, harsh realities we're living through. Yeah. So um, after California, you came back um, to, and I'm, I'm not quite sure on this, so you have to correct me. Was it to, with the intention of making films with your later uh, husband, your soon-to-be husband, Jean Chamaron, or was it go back to Beirut, see what happens? W what was the plan? No, you know, I couldn't wait to finish, even though San Francisco was amazing. But I was like really on fire. I wanted to go and make films. I couldn't wait. Um, and I came to Beirut with the idea that to make films, you know, I, I really had so much to say because I'd seen, you know, lived through a lot, even though I was still young. But uh, growing up in Lebanon, you really, uh, I mean, I really had a lot to say. And I met Jean. And uh, we clicked immediately, even though we're from different backgrounds. There's a, I think we completed each other and uh, we started to work together immediately. Uh, this was uh, end of 81, 82. And our, uh, I mean, our, our first film together was during the siege of Beirut, the Israeli invasion. And this image, I think it's, um, it kind of uh, symbolizes that time, you know, of filming uh, under the rubble, under the bombing, yeah. because most, many, most of our films, and even the films I made later, have been made in the time, times of war or uh, invasions or uh, uprisings. So um, we were a team together. I mean, uh, we completed each other. We, uh, uh, we were kind of uh, unique in the sense that we made films together, especially in the first, uh, the first few films were, that we made were co-directed by both of us. Um, and that was, uh, that's unique in a way, and it's not always easy. You really have to have the right uh, kind of dynamic. And we were able to create that. And with every film, we tried something new. We were like experimenting, discovering, uh, working with real uh, in reality. Yeah, it's, a, it's amazing. The, these photos are so touching. Um, so I'd like to sort of for a second zoom out on on your body of work and uh, cue up for the, the, the people on the call. 
you have so much, you've, you've uh, produced so much stuff that um, uh, you and I spoke about this beforehand. I'd love to be able to zoom in on this uh, sort of the children tr trilogy at the early part of your career. Um, if there are questions for other films in the, in the chat, that's great. And then we'll talk about 3000 Nights. Um, but there is enough time, there's enough work here to talk to you for hours and hours and hours. So let's <laughs> talk about those three to start. Um, mm -hmm. Did you conceive those three films as a trilogy to begin with, or they just were subsequent? You finished one and you thought, oh, we, we got to do something else. Yeah. You know, it was a process because before the trilogy, there was a whole experience uh, that led to that. Um, uh, I mean, life experience, uh, so many subjects, people, everything that, um, uh, I mean, uh, there was a whole period of making films in Beirut with Jean, but um, during the first Intifada in Palestine in 1887, I decided to go back for the first time to my hometown, Nablus, at the height of the uprising. And that was when I made Children of Fire, which is the first of the trilogy, but it wasn't uh, conceived as a trilogy. It was like, you know, I, um, I had to go back. And um, to me, it was like a turning point in my life. And I would say maybe the first um, after 82 and that really experience of living in Beirut during the siege and that really affected me, I think, as a person and filmmaker and really prepared me for all of the challenges later on. This was the second major uh, turning point for me going to Palestine uh, almost uh, seven, seven, five years after the siege of Beirut. Yeah. And uh, Nablus was under siege and curfew. And it was like a hub of the resistance and uh, uprising in Palestine at the time. And so this image here is, uh, was taken on the first, uh, upon our arrival into the town. But this was, I mean, we were, I was forbidden from going in with the team. We had to go in through back roads. It was like, a, uh, the whole film was filmed in secret because um, the uh, Nablus was under occupation. And there, there was a, up, the whole town was um, an uprising against this occupation. And they had just killed two young people. One of them happened to be our neighbor in the same building where I um, came. So I, for me, this film was like discovering Palestine and discovering my own city, finally uh, like getting to know my own relatives, but in very like, uh, challenging and difficult situations, which was, uh, you know, I'm making a film, but this film um, ha became a process, you know, about how to make a film under occupation, you know, under siege. All my, the ideas I had even before I had to adapt. So because most of it was filmed in secret, like we were hiding you know, the, the image before you saw me and the, the sun and we were like hi, uh, hiding and filming from the window because the soldiers were like bashing in the doors and uh, arresting I, people. Can uh, I ask a, a logistical question? What, yeah. where did you, where did you edit the film? I mean, where, how did you process the, the film itself? How did you, I mean, it's one yeah. thing to, to shoot in secret. But then what do you do with all the undeveloped film? I used to smuggle them out with my cousins <laughs> from the town and we used to shoot on uh, cinema film reels. And then where would you edit it? Uh, I, would, uh, I, I would send them outside of the country. I edited in London actually okay. afterwards. But uh, I, I couldn't see what I was shooting because it's yeah. film, you have to develop it afterwards. Um, so uh, it, the film's about two young children. One of them is five years old, Fadi, and an 11 year old girl, Hannah, uh, who uh, are in neighbors in the same building. So the whole story is, it takes place in the, um, in the neighborhood. And I discovered that, uh, uh, you know, that I didn't have to tell the whole story, you know, by focusing on uh, these stories within the, 
within where I was living, the neighborhood. The, you know, I could tell a much bigger story, by, but by focusing on the details and especially through the lives of the children. And that, that opened my um, kind of interest in working with children after this film and gave me a really strong connection because um, as a Palestinian, I hadn't really grown up in Palestine. So I was like kind of building the sense of belonging through the camera, through my uh, experience there, through the people. Uh, and this stayed with me and really rooted me, I think it grounded me and prepared me again for the next stages. So after Children of Fire, I went on to make the next film, which is um, Children of Shatila. Uh, before we move into Shatila, I wanna ask a question about that last, that last point you just said about focusing on the small. Um, to tell a broader, a, long, a larger story. That's, um, that's a, a, a brilliant technique. Were you aware of that tech? Were you aware you were doing that? Or did you think, well, this is what I have. The, the limitations, I'm stuck here. I can only tell maybe this small angle. Or were you, did you understand, oh, I'm gonna use this as a, a broader sort of allegory? You know, I think uh, I was discovering the power of that kind of uh, uh, storytelling as, yeah. as I went along because I hadn't planned it like that. The plans I had uh, evaporated because I was like under siege in this apartment with, these, uh, with a crew, a small crew, and we, couldn't, we really couldn't film what I had planned, but I discovered that it's much more powerful to film the actual process, you know, yeah. And it became like a daily journal and uh, the sounds and what you couldn't really see the whole, you know, and I, this, this really is powerful, I think, uh, because it's, um, it's very raw and very real. And um, in the end, I, it's about telling stories of, of, of characters and people and, uh, you know, the details, I think. And, and that taught me that, the, that um, and gave me also, I think, an interest in making films that are like uh, self-contained. Yeah. Uh, and no, not trying to, to say too much because you can say a lot more when you go deeper, and especially with working with children, it's fascinating. Yeah, I think it's a, a really, really um, astute, um, astute observation and, and really a powerful sort of mechanism for storytelling. Um, it's also a powerful mechanism to empower your subjects with their own, uh, their own platform to tell their own stories. For those who haven't seen the film, explain what we're looking at here and why you're handing this, uh, this child of uh, a video camera. <laughs> yes, this is Children of Shatila, yeah. which I made a few years later, actually in 98 or 88, yeah. <laughs> which is the 50th anniversary of the of the Nakba of 48. Uh, I had the idea of giving, you know, video cameras were brand new at the time, the small uh, handy cams. And I had the idea of giving cameras to the children. And this was before it became like fashionable to do that. It was like an early, one of the earlier films. And I, what I wanted to do really, I had this, I wanted to see through the children's eyes. I, I, I wanted them to film their own reality to see what they would, do with the camera, what, how they would tell th their own stories. And uh, in Children of Shatila, there are two main characters. One, of, uh, one is Isa and the other is uh, Farah, both 11 and 12 year old uh, children uh, in Shatila. And um, it's fascinating because uh, with the camera, they were like, uh, was like a toy for them. It was like a and ama amazing for them to see their own reality like uh, framed in a camera. They were so excited. And uh, in this picture here, one of the children is interviewing uh, one, an, an older man in the neighborhood and ask him, um, asking him about his memories about Palestine. And uh, this man was like so touching when he was saying how he left Palestine. And they were asking all these questions and uh, in the end, he tells them, promise me, you know, this, that you'll never forget Palestine. And, and I, you know, that's so powerful. And the whole film is about this connection 
with um, of this third generation, these children of fourth generation who were born outside of Palestine, their connection to Palestine through the memories and the you know the, that are passed on from generation to generation. Yeah, but told with a lot of imagination, with a lot of uh, playfulness, because again, with children, you never know what to expect. And this is what I love. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, I thought it was, uh, you know, this idea, particularly, obviously, pre cell phone and pre uh, story time, uh, uh, Instagram stories and social media, but this idea of um, not only the, the viewers uh, seeing through the children's eyes, but <laughs> The filmmaker seeing through the children's eyes is is really 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 powerful. Um, I'm curious, what was the response of the children to the film? Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, they're they're not children anymore. They're older no, than me. No, they're not children, and yeah. uh, I've maintained a very strong connection with all of the children, even children of uh, Nablus, you know, and the children of Shatila, and the films that I made afterwards. I think the film was like a major, for them, a major also experience because it, for some of the, the children, it, uh, it really had an impact um, on their lives, uh, what they, their choices later in life. Um, watching the film too with them, like it's, it's the, I, I, for me, this is the most, the moment where you show the film to the people that you made the film about is really the most, uh, kind of critical and uh, touching moment because um, they loved, I mean, seeing their lives on the big screen, you know? And uh, I, I think it made a, an impact on them that's long lasting because uh, especially now, I mean, now that they've grown up, they have their children, they continued their education. A lot of the, uh, you know, Farah now, for instance, has become uh, a PhD uh, in engineering. Uh, I think the film uh, had an impact because for, I, I wanted also through the film to be able to, to um, affect their lives, to do, to bring something back, you know, to them tangible that would make an impact on their lives. Amazing. Okay, let's move on to the, the third of the trilogy. Um, and then we should have enough time to talk about 2000 nights, and then we'll be able to, uh, um, we'll be able to talk, open up to the chat. So um, the third in the trilogy was uh, Frontiers of Dreams and Fears. Um, for me, the, the imagery from, from this film is absolutely uh, stunning. Um, walk us through a little bit how the idea for this came about. Yes, by now I realized that this was becoming a trilogy. Uh, with frontiers of dreams and fears, yeah. or Ahlam and Mantra in Arabic. Uh, and uh, I made it with some of the same children that I had uh, filmed in Children of Shatila. Uh, few years, this is like two years after Children of Shatila. Uh, by then, internet was a new phenomena also, just like the cameras before video. And uh, I, for, Suddenly, Palestinians in, in refugee camps in Lebanon and elsewhere were able to communicate, you know, with their relatives in Palestine. And these children, and, and this picture, Muna, in Shatila, uh, they were starting to communicate with another group of children, Muna and Manar, from the Heshi camp in Palestine through the internet, sending messages to each other. And I felt this was really powerful the idea of communication and uh, following the stories of, um, again, um, children, but through this new medium, which is the internet, you know. That so it started with uh, speaking to, I think Muna was uh, the, the, the now, now uh, woman in, uh, from Shatila. Was it Muna or Manar in uh, Shatila? Muna is from Shatila. And so she, you saw, you started seeing Mona go online and she told you about this relationship she was forming with uh, Manar. Yes, and also online, a friend of basically, mine. This friendship. A friend of mine was also volunteering there and uh, I realized, and she was like um, encouraging them to contact each other. 
as a way of improving, like uh, of making connections and practicing even their English and Arabic. And, and then I felt that I was fascinated by the idea of that connection yeah. bridge because I'd made films in many films in Lebanon and made films in Palestine, but never anything uh, connecting, uh, you know, and, I, and, and to me, that was the beginning point. But then the, the friendship developed and the, there was letter writing and I was going back and forth and taking letters back and forth. And then, um, and you know, the, the, the children, the, you know, they're very, especially Mona, she's like, the way she speaks and that image you showed before with the bird, I think, you know, the bird is always something, a metaphor that comes back in, in, in all my films. She, she talks about, when she talks about her life, uh, she talks in images of poetry. You know, she's like a, uh, the words she uses is so poetic. And in, in the beginning, in, in, in the beginning of the film, she talks about how she used to dream of, uh, of being a butterfly, but then she changed her mind when she discovered that, you know, butterflies are captured and put inside a, a book that she'd prefer to be a bird so she could fly to Palestine. You know, the words like that gave me, kind of uh, guided me as I was making this film. And um, I was able to uh, bring them together at a very key moment too, later in a um, few months after they had met, uh, when uh, Lebanon, South Lebanon was liberated in 2000. And for the first time, uh, Palestinians were able to meet each other across the border on the barbed wire. And I had the idea of bringing, bringing the children to the border. And those moments, I think, were very, I mean, first of all, unique because, um, you know, those moments are like his, history happening in front of the camera. And here, you know, about, it was about capturing that moment, that emotion, that, uh, uh, you know, images that you would never see probably. Uh, and here, for instance, in this image, uh, the, it's a brother and sister who are meeting for the first time in 52 years, since 1948. And they're already old. They were separated as children and here they are meeting. It's so touching, you know, uh, with the barbed wire between them. It like carries so much um, uh, hope, uh, you know, a history of all those years of suffering, but, uh, you know, finally meeting together, hope, a moment of, um, you know, possible, like, you know, land that was liberated, you know, this gave so much hope, I think, for, for, for people. And me as, uh, like, being there, I, well, it was like, I felt I was living in history as it was happening. So the children were there, I was able to bring them from both sides, and that was, I think, a miracle, big to be able to bring them, you know, because it was quite difficult to bring the children, especially on the Palestinian side, because there's so many checkpoints, there's so many lo logistics, but we were, you know, able to bring them to the border and um, live those moments together. And I think that that really is what makes it, gives the film its uh, power, you know, that you climactic moment. As you're making stuff, uh, films like this, in moments that are so powerful, um, I would imagine that it's, it's it's near impossible to to not be emotional, not be affected. Um, but at the same time, you're I would imagine you're also trying to balance uh, telling the story in a way that should let the viewer, um, you know, be a conduit and allow the, the viewer to see the images like and not feel your fingerprints almost. Yeah. Well, Do you I think about that? I didn't need to have any fingerprints here because it was so, the moment was so powerful, it was yeah. magical. And here, you know, this happens a lot. I think in film, when you can capture, it's about capturing those magical moments and yeah. as they are. But um, I mean, in the editing, it's, you know, you can, how you put them together, but uh, uh, this, I didn't, re I didn't, it was very emotional. I'll tell you, I was very like, uh, myself and the crew, 
I had a small crew, a camera and a sound. We were all crying in tears of happiness with everyone, you know, because yeah. we, we felt the power of the moment, that hope that, uh, you know, mixed with uh, so many feelings. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's emotion there. And I think it, the audience feels that too, because uh, this is Manar and they're holding hands, you know, on either side. And just a few days after we were filming, we were forbidden, became, uh, I mean, the Israeli soldiers realized, you know, this was like, there were thousands of people coming to the border, you know, there was a hope, but it was like overwhelming. And they decided to, to, to uh, forbid it any further contact and turned the whole area into a closed military zone. So it was impossible to film after those f f first few days. So really, this kind of filmmaking is about seizing those moments, you know, and um, uh, putting them, I mean, making films because they're, they're not really, you know, history is not, um, it's a way of writing, I think, history, this kind yeah. of filmmaking, safeguarding those moments, those memories. Uh, otherwise, they just get the forgotten especially in a region like ours, where there's so many events, one event after the other erases the other. And I think these moments, you really need to treasure them because they're, they're so powerful, they're so meaningful. And uh, inspiring so this was, too, I think. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, all of your, all of your films are uh, at once uh, heartbreaking and uplifting, um, so. It's a hard, it's a hard song to play. Um, let's let's talk about Three Thousand Nights uh, briefly. Um, I'm sure there's going to be lots of questions in the chat about it, um, so I won't spend too much time because I'm looking at the clock. Um, but the first thing I noticed when I went to go see this uh, six years ago in New York um, was that it's a feature. Um, how long had you been wanting to do a feature? Um, or was it a, all of a sudden this idea came to mind and, and, you, and you thought this is better, th that format uh, fits the storytelling better than a documentary? Yeah, it's a process for me. And the idea for 3000 Nights actually came many years before when I was in Nablus shooting during the first uh, Intifada. Um, and I had met a woman a Palestinian woman who had been imprisoned and had had a child inside an Israeli prison in chains. And this story uh, stayed with me, it was haunting me for years. And um, I, although I, I made many films in the meantime, and some of them also in my documentaries, the idea of incarceration comes back, you know, I yeah. made films in Lebanon, Ansar and Khiam prison, you know, during the Israeli occupation. So this idea of incarceration was in my mind. So it's a process. And by then I felt that I, I, this had to be told as a fiction, you know, as a narrative. But it's, uh, in, it's entirely based on a true story. All the events in it are based on real events. And this is the kind of films I like. Um, but I, by, I felt I wanted to have more control uh, uh, of the storytelling and also of, um, of the aesthetic you know, and be able to, to um, work on different layers uh, and uh, recreate the drama because this is a very dramatic uh, film of a child growing up inside a uh, prison, you know, and a mother and recreating that childhood for, you know, uh, that world for a child who's never seen the outside. And uh, within the context of um, Palestinian prisoners, women prisoners, and it's, Probably the first film, I think, the first narrative film about women, Palestinian women prisoners. Yeah, it's it's absolutely stunning, <clears throat> stunning film. I highly recommend everybody check it out. Um, this this photo this photo um, it really moved yeah. me. Before we move into the Q and A, tell us what's happening in this photo. Yeah, this was a great um, moment because this is when I showed uh, 3000 Nights in Shatila camp. Uh, everybody's sitting there, you know, excited to watch the film. And, he, and this is with Kifah Afifi, who's a former prisoner herself. 
a liberated prisoner. And we had made a film about her called Woman Beyond Borders. And she was in prison, in Khiam prison. And Khiam, uh, as you know, probably, you know, when, during the liberation of uh, South Lebanon, the, the people of the South, they broke, they broke open the prison and they liberated the prisoners. So there's a very special connection with Kifah. And uh, we both presented the film and it was shown in Shatila. And there were like people on the balconies in their homes outside, you know, watching and like, um, like reacting with the film because this is like their story, you know, and uh, uh, I mean, these are the moments I really treasure. The film has been showed, shown worldwide, but to me, the, these kind of screenings are, are screenings uh, that mean a lot to me. It's about bringing the films back to the people. Yeah, beautiful. Okay, I'm looking at the watch. I'm gonna to try to go through this. So for the quick Q&A, there are four questions. I'm gonna to try to get you to go through them quite quickly. So what are you reading or watching right now? Well, I'm watching a lot of films because I'm on the, I recently became a member of the Oscars Academy. So I have, we're voting for the Oscar films next week. Wow, congratulations. <laughs> there's some great films. And there's some Arab films too, even in the final uh, finalists. Yeah. So uh, reading a lot, I have a whole stack of uh, books next to my bed. Uh, uh, I'm reading uh, Ibrahim Nasrallah. I read in Arabic and English, yeah, his trilogy. Uh, uh, it's called um, uh, The Trilogy of Bells, Thulathiyat al Ajras, also Susan Abu al Hawa, okay. Against the Loveless World. That's her most recent novel. There are many other books too. I love Suad Amiri also. Who uh, doesn't? I know you interviewed her. She's a great friend. I love her books. So I have all stack, uh, I'm going, you know, some books I reread, I love to reread them because I'm always, uh, it's like a dialogue. Me too. Between the films and the books and, you know. Yeah. Um, okay, who would you love to shadow for a day past or present? Well, present, uh, there's another filmmaker I really love. Her name's Mira Nayir, she's an Indian filmmaker. I love her work. Uh, it's amazing the way when she speaks, I feel it's me you know, because her work really uh, is very similar to what I've been doing, but in a different context in India, but, um, and in the States, but working with children again, and, uh, I would love to spend more time with her. Cool. Um, what do people most misunderstand about your work? Well, I'm, uh, I, I suppose uh, the fact that uh, my films have a very like strong message. Sometimes some people might say, why, you know, uh, that they're political and, you know, why not make more films about you know, like comedy or uh, romance, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so there's always that kind of, uh, I think, discussion. Um, Okay, um, whose work do you admire or are inspired by? I can imagine that the list is quite long, but if there's anyone that you think... Yeah, you again, out, I mean, since admire. we mentioned uh, Mira Nair, I, uh, I think she's uh, inspiring to me. And actually we did a, a masterclass together when I was in New York and screened uh, 3000 Nights. And she had just uh, finished her new film, uh, Queen of Catway. So it was an amazing kind of dialogue. Um, but lots of people inspire me. But I, you know, to, to focus again, I would say Mira Nair. Okay, great. Okay, our first question comes from Ala. Ala, I know you asked a, a bunch of questions. If you could just choose one, that would be great. All right. Sorry about that. I'm just no, very that's great. excited. <laughs> I love it. All right. Um, I first I wanted to know, like, when did you realize you favored documentary over fiction, and why was that? What kind of uh, switched your your button? Well, uh, I don't favor one over the other, actually. <laughs> I'm, uh, but when I was starting, you know, I just finished, uh, graduated from San Francisco, went back to Beirut. I mean, it was like uh, war. Um, and it wasn't, you know, there were so many real stories and real events 
powerful and you know it was natural to to uh, think documentary because uh, you know it's like there you know you can't really that, those days weren't the a time to sit back and you know kind of uh, write fiction because it was like happening and um, true those years and I think documentary is such a powerful learning experience it's about life for me it uh, shaped who I am uh, because I was able to live more intensely because of my films to live moments that otherwise I would never have lived to meet people I would never have met but now I'm processing everything I've lived through and I've lived through a lot because you know <laughs> and made films but I want to revisit some of those major like um, turning points uh, and revisit them in fiction. I think now is, you know, like time to dig deeper and reflect in a different Great. way, with a different medium. Thank you. Thanks, Alaa. Uh, next one is Nariman. Nariman, yes. Hi, everybody. Hi, Hi Ma. Hello. <laughs> uh, I miss you very much, Mai. Mm -hmm. I have two questions for you. Are you thinking of establishing an academy for how to direct films? And the other question is, uh, are you thinking of uh, going back to Nablus to make a new movie? Shukran. Shukran, <laughs> Wow. Nariman was with me in those days, by the way, in the Intifada. <laughs> and she was hiding the films and <laughs> taking care of me. <laughs> I would love to uh, um, be part of establishing something. Yes, Academy. I think there's several. It's like uh, we don't have to establish something new because there's several schools already uh, teaching uh -huh. film in Palestine. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's one, Ramallah. The, uh, Nablus is a good. Uh, in the University of Najah already. I think it's a we should strengthen these schools and not necessarily start for something new. I would love to go back to Nablus to make a film because like I said, it's not enough. Um, I feel I want to go dig deeper. And there's a lot more that I didn't say that I want to say now. <laughs> Um, thanks so much. Our next question comes from Lina. Yeah, hi, uh, May. It's so hi. good to see you. And uh, thank you, Mikey, for organizing this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, my, because I'm a huge fan, my question is what's next? What are you currently working on? When, when will we see your next film? Yes, I'm working. Um, I'm working away. By the, <laughs> I'm finishing. I, I made a documentary in uh, Beirut during the uprising, focusing on four young women artists. So I'm finishing that, and I'm writing a new script. Uh, I'm working on several ideas, but uh, they're all fiction. They're all fiction, and they're to do with Palestine. Uh, one of them. Uh, one of them would be shot in Nablus. I'm interested in going back a bit in history and um, uh, looking at, you know, our, like the Nakba 48, uh, the Intifada, but through the eyes uh, here, I'm interested in the experience of a poet uh, from Nablus, Fadwa Tukan, the iconic uh, Palestinian uh, poet. And I'm fascinated by the idea of, um, the old city and her, her, her life, you know, behind the walls because she was, uh, she spent her childhood behind walls. You know, I'm always interested in this idea of incarceration. So that's one idea, but I have several others that I'm developing. So definitely my next project will be uh, fiction. Great. The next question comes from Ahlam. Um, but she asked me to read it for her. Um, the question is, does shooting in secret and making films that might be forbidden inform how you distribute and promote them afterwards? Well, surprisingly enough, Children of Fire was made for the BBC. <laughs> and it was shown on TV, of course. 
but uh, the producer that uh, you know they had no no clue that I was filming in secret. You know they didn't couldn't fathom the idea. You know uh, that was uh, the conditions of filming were very difficult, but it shaped the film in the end, and it was screened to a big audience. Um, but each film has a different kind of uh, distribution. It's not very easy, you know, to distribute Palestinian films. So it's a big scoop when you're able to show it uh, to a wide audience. Uh, now with uh, online and uh, the VOD, it's become easier in a way to reach uh, uh, many people. Uh, and things are changing, I think, uh, even in Hollywood. I'm very kind of uh, happy to see that there are more films that are being uh, made uh, that are being screened uh, also. Um, with 3,000 Nights, it was released in several right. countries. So that, that's good, but it's, it's, it's not easy at all. Yeah, for sure. Um, great. Uh, Karen, you're up next. Hi, May. It's Karen. Um, I'm curious how one can get hold of the films for local libraries in the States. I'm always interested in promoting these films to have them accessible to the general public, you know, people that might not think about looking for them, but if they're on the shelf in the library in D DVD format or something. Yes, they definitely. Would... If you go to the website of 3000 Nights, uh, you, there's, um, you can uh, find the distributor, you can find also uh, how to get the uh, 3000 Nights and some of the other films, uh, just send a message uh, on the website and uh, you can find out. There are also, uh, some of them are on uh, Amazon Prime, like 3000 Nights, but for libraries, it's better to go to the website of okay. 3000 Nights. Thank you. Great. Um, the next question comes from, sorry, um, Dama. Dama, let me... Um, so, well, hi, May. I wanted to ask you, did you visit pa Palestine after 1993? And if yes, how did you feel about the difference that occurred in Palestine after your previous visit? Like when I read uh, the uh, Murid Barghouti's book, Ra'it Ramallah, it really struck me the paradox he felt when he came back to Palestine after more than 30 years. So how could you relate to these type of feelings? Yeah, actually, I was, uh, I always go back uh, when I made 3000 Nights, that was like a few years ago. So uh, I do see changes. I mean, uh, I'm nostalgic actually for the time of the first Intifada because that was a time when there was a, like a popular uprising resistance uh, vision kind of for liberation, the future. Um, it's become more and more, I can see the changes on the ground. It's, you know, the settlements, the, the, it's like a, uh, the land is being eaten up uh, day, every single day. And um, the political situation too is reached like, a, you know, there are not many options. It's, it's the, the but, you know, on that, that's on one level, the political level, but I think culturally what's going on is very inspiring because there's so many uh, expressions, uh, you know, it's so vibrant. Uh, all this suffering is like being flourishing in the, you know, in the arts, it's a way of uh, expressing all uh, this reality, you know, and then changing that and kind of uh, giving hope and, in the cinema or in the painting, there's, there's really, I think a lot going on in literature. Um, so that's where I see hope. And uh, that's where I see my role of making a difference on that cultural level. Great. Uh, we have a question from Ria. Yes, hi, May. Um, it's re really nice to see you again. I've been following you for many, many years. Um, I, something you said right now triggered a question, so I'm going to ask that question instead of the question I had posed on the Q&A. Um, you, you were saying about art and artists' responsibility to reflect our reality. 
uh, there is something that I think about very often in that because our reality is often very uh, negative, very sad. And most of our art and our films and our songs and our, any expression that, that we project to the outside is often naked. <laughs> uh, so people have to prepare themselves usually before they watch an Arabic movie because they know it's gonna be painful and hard and um, heavy. Uh, do you think it's part of the artist's responsibility to change that concept of, of Arabs being the, the kings and queens of Naked and, and maybe um, starting to create content that, that gives us hope and, and enlightens lightens our mood uh, as, a, as a speaking people, as a people projecting our image to the outside world? Yeah, but you know, uh, none of the films that I can think about, the Palestinian films, none of them focus on Nakad, you know? Uh, they, they all have this uh, hope, uh, at least I can say that the work I've, I mean, I, to me, it's always important to keep hope, but you have to, you know, hope coming out of all this uh, suffering, but there's hope uh, and to inspire people. So I don't, I agree, we shouldn't, and then we don't, you know, I don't think that our films are um, about sadness or nakad, like you say, uh, they, they are quite inspiring. They're like changing, I think the, uh, p they're like inspiring people to, 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 to think and some to take action, you know, to, to do. I think that they're, the, they're quite powerful in that sense. And I think you, uh, it's not one or the, you can do a lot in a, in a film that uh, deals with the reality. You can focus on the humor or you can focus on the, the, you know, the love stories within that. You know, the, it's, um, it's about, I think we, about uh, the way we approach our stories and always to focus on the humanity. I think that's the key. Yeah. If you can focus on the humanity and bring those human stories you can touch people, and that's what we want. That's, a, I think, a perfect place to end. Um, for those of you who are on the call, if you're interested in learning more about May's work, um, I highly recommend checking out the book that just uh, came out relatively recently, Love and Resistance in the Film of May Mustard. Uh, I have it on the screen. Um, also, you can look up her films online, on Amazon, and inshallah, uh, many more places soon. Um, thank you so much, May, for joining. Um, this was really a thrill for me. Thank you, Mikey. And thanks for the great work you're doing. I really appreciate it. It's really no, thank amazing you. interviews, amazing. It's thanks like so much. Really and a shout out to your daughter, Noor, who is on the chat right now, who is also an African uh, presenter and alum. Um, uh, so uh, it runs, it's a, a family affair. I also added um, the... Uh, the link to the, the feedback form in the chat. And if you're interested in supporting our Fikra and keeping our work going and growing, please consider becoming one of our uh, monthly contributors. And join us on Thursday. We have another talk uh, with a musicologist based in the University of Kuwait who does incredible work studying music from the Gulf. And on Saturday, there's an amazing, amazing community presentation with four beautiful high school students from the American School of Palestine at Ramallah. It's going to be really, really good. Um, so come and support these kids. They are awesome. Thank you, Mikey. Okay, everybody. Take care. Thanks so much. Thank you.